So, welcome everyone to this uh, third day of the conference on quantum foundations. We are really glad to have again Professor Karol Zikskowski from the Czechelonian University from Krakow, Poland. He will speak about 36 entangled officers of Euler quantum solutions of a classically non solvable problem. Please, Karol, go on. Yes, thank you very much. Muchas gracias por la invitación a Argentina. I'm only, um, I regret I cannot come on site to visit Cordoba or Buenos Aires, but I'm very, very pleased to be here with you online, especially that maybe some of you know, we have now a guest from Argentina. So Diego Busanti is here with us and we have a, a collaboration on some projects related to quantum theory. But now I will tell you about some other projects which was done together in a collaboration with India. Let me mention Arul Lakshminarayan from Chennai and his student uh, Suail Latter and my students Adam Burkhardt, Wojciech Bruzda and Grzegorz Reichel Mircic. Well, let me start a very general question. What is at the center of theoretical physics in general? Well, we would like to answer some basic questions like what is the correct theory to describe the world around us? What is the correct theory to describe the world at the micro scale? Is quantum theory we know capable to describe the world at the micro scale? If not, perhaps we need some more generalized quantum theory. If yes, how such a theory might look like? If no, how to extract as much as possible from the standard quantum theory? Well, some time ago, I was interested in those generalized quantum theories. I published a paper on generalized quartic quantum theory, quartic because instead of density matrices, we use density tensors. But today, I'm going back to the standard quantum theory. And in the framework of standard quantum mechanics, I'm going to look for extremal quantum states and try to find their applications. Well, uh, what about quantum states? I'm pretty sure you know very well what is this about, but let me make a very short introduction. So we consider finite dimensional Hilbert space like n dimensional Hilbert space. If n is two, we have a qubit, so quantum bit. So any point at the block sphere represents a state you can use those geographic coordinates like longitude and latitude. The situation is a bit more complicated for arbitrary n. Then the space of all states, they are of course normalized and we consider equivalence classes up to a phase. So then this space is not a sphere. It is a complex projective space with two n minus two real dimensions. But now look, the space is isotropic, like a sphere. So you could say, well, all states are equal. So there are no extremal states. What I'm going to talk about, all states are the same. In some sense, it's, this is correct point of view. If we have no additional structure, then the space is really isotropic. It looks like as a sphere, all points uh, look the same. No points are distinguished. However, if we impose some structure to the system, then we can say that all quantum states are equal, but some of them are more equal than others. For instance, if we consider a composite two qubit system, so I have here two pairs, one is left, one is right. So I have a system and I can decompose it into two parts. So now, of course, we can distinguish separable states, so product states, which are distinguished. And on the opposite end, we have maximally entangled Bell states. So obviously, they are special states. They are, I could say, more equal than other states, just because I observe that this system, physical system, we can split into two parts. So I distinguished left subsystem and right subsystem. So then we can look for those extremal states, for instance, like Bell states, which are most entangled states for two qubit systems. They are useful in several applications, like in quantum information, in different protocols. So this gives us a good motivation to study them. So to remind you some simple definitions, if we have bipartite systems, so separable pure states are just of this tensor product structure, entangled are not of this form. Simple case is the famous Bell state. 
we see it is not a, a product state. So zero, zero, of course, means zero times zero. But here we have a sum, so a superposition of two states. So therefore, this is not a product state. It's entangled. In fact, it's maximally entangled. Why? Because partial trace of the projector is maximally mixed. So technically, we can take any state and expand it in, in any product basis. So we have here this matrix of coefficients. And now we can compute singular values of this matrix. Let's denote them by lambda. And they appear here in this so-called Schmidt decomposition. Instead of double sum here, we have a single sum here at the expense of changing, changing both bases into I prime and I double prime. And now, because the state is normalized, so norm of C is one, all those mm, mm, numbers, lambda, let's call them Schmidt values, they sum to unity, so they define a probability vector. There, this probability vector is nothing else as eigenvalue, so spectrum of partial trace. And then to characterize the degree of mixing of this vector lambda, we use the standard for Neumann entropy. And then we say that the entanglement entropy of the bipartite state psi is equal to the von Neumann entropy of the partial trace. So minus trace sigma log sigma, where sigma is this partial trace, or Shannon entropy of the vector of Schmidt coefficients. By the way, if something is not clear, not mentioned, not explained, please do not hesitate to, to stop and to, uh, write, to ask questions right away. We can easily generalize this setup for higher dimensions. If I have two Q dits, so two subsystems of size D, I define the generalized Bell states. Look, it consists of, there is a sum of D terms with the same prefactor. So it means that all singular values lambda are equal. They are just one over, um, lambdas are one over D. So then this state is maximally entangled because the reduced state, so partial trace is maximally mixed. And then state psi is maximally entangled if partial trace is maximally mixed. So this matrix C of coefficients defined before is unitary up to rescaling. Then of course, all singular values of a unitary matrix, so they are just a radius of eigenvalues are equal to one. By the way, look at this state. I can call it Haramal state, zero, zero plus zero, one minus one, zero minus one, one. So look, you have three pluses and one minus. Maybe it's not easy to see, maybe it is. It is equivalent to the Bell state. It is really a, entangled state. Why? Because this matrix, if you compute this matrix, is one, one in the second column, one minus one. So just a hard amount matrix is unitary. So in short, for bipartite systems, everything is simple. We write down the state in a product basis and this matrix C characterizes entanglement. It's enough to compute entropy of the vector of singular values of this matrix C to describe entanglement of such a state. This is simple for a bipartite system, like two objects. But if we have more, like three or more, then the situation is much more complicated. Why? OK, multipartite are more complicated than bipartite. Mathematically speaking, well, there is a huge difference between two and three. So here, 2D object is, OK, easier to describe than 3D. So multi for me is three or more. And why it is so? Well, I have a simple algebraic argument. If I have a state describing three subsystems, A, B, and C, then I can expand this state in a product basis as before. But now, instead of this matrix CIJ, I have a tensor labeled with three indices, I, J, K. And here, simple algebraic arguments enter the game because it is easy to diagonalize a matrix, compute its rank, find its singular values, and so on. And for tensor, everything is much more complicated. Even the notion of a rank of a tensor, OK, there are many different definitions. And they do coincide for matrices for tensors 
it is much more difficult and to compute the tensor norm is also more complicated than to compute the norm of a matrix. So now having such a family of pure states of free or more apartheid system, we can pose a legitimate question, which of those states, so let's say we have a N subsystems with D levels each. So in the jargon, there are N QD system, which of those states is the most entangled? Well, for instance, for three qubits, we have GHZ states. It looks like this, so simple generalization of Bell states. But we also have a W state. It consists of three terms. And as you see, they are somehow different. They are not equivalent. So we can ask which of those states is more entangled. And the answer is, as you can guess, simple. The answer is we do not know. Why? Because it depends. It depends on which measure of entanglement you take into account. So in principle, the answer to the question which is the most entangled is still, the question is not well specified. It depends on the measure entanglement of entanglement use. Before I continue, I will make a short combinatorial uh, digression. So uh, look, um, I will recall an interesting paper by Zauner, Gerald Zauner, in fact, it was a thesis from nine, uh, 25 years, no, 20, 22 years ago. And in his thesis, basically, he, well, I would say, uh, made the foundations of quantum combinatorics. I will tell you what I mean about it, but first, um, well, I will make a simple example, classical combinatorics. We have a lot of cards, like here I have a few cards, but let's imagine we have 16 cards. We take four aces, four kings, four queens, four jacks, and we want to arrange them into an array four times four, such that in every row and every column consists only a single card of each suit and each rank. A simple question. Is it simple to find the solution? How do you think? Are you there? I will take a sip of tea and please let me know. Are you there? Yes, are you alive? Yeah, yeah. Yes, Carol. Yes, we hear you. We hear you. Very well. Okay. So here's a solution. As you can guess, it exists. Look, we have 16 cards, and we place them in such a way that in each column, each row, they are exactly one card of each suit, each rank. So this is called in mathematical notation the two mutually orthogonal Latin squares or Greco Latin squares of size four. Greek or Latin, because Euler used Greek letters to describe, let's say, rank of the card and Latin to describe the color. And mutually orthogonal means that each card basically is different. So look, such scheme exists for, of, uh, for 16 cards and you place them into a square of size four, you can have such squares of size three and five, but you will not have them for size Two, why? Uh, if you take two cards, like two aces, now look, you have two aces and you want to put the king. You cannot put it neither here nor there, why? Because a rule that there are no two cards of the same color will be violated. So you see with four cards, it's easy to see that there are no two orthogonal Latin squares of size two. And there exists, as I showed you, two orthogonal Latin square of size three, four, and five, you can believe me. And with six, there are problems. There was a famous problem attributed to Euler. There was a very nice practical application, in a sense, a military application. The idea was he was, you know, then employed by child working in St. Petersburg in Russia. So of course there was, there was a lot of uh, officers and, and military pilots. And the question was, if you have 36 officers of six different ranks, from six different units with different uniforms, can you arrange them in such a square six times six, such that in each row, each column, uh, all uniforms are different? So mathematically speaking is a question whether there exists a Greek or Latin square of size six. And even Euler himself was not able to prove that it doesn't exist. But of course he knew that it doesn't exist. So it was only a conjecture by Euler. And therefore this question is now called the problem of 36 officers of Euler, and we know that the problem has no solution. 
We know because 120 years, uh, 21 years later, Gaston Terry, a French, he was not a mathematician, he was a lawyer, he uh, published a paper where basically he solved the problem in a negative way because his main feat was to show that there are some many thousands of possibilities, but he could reduce those thousands to, let's say, a few hundreds, and then one by one he could check that no solution exists. So, by the way, uh, have you ever seen such a game for kids? So look, you have 36 pieces and you have to put it into such a square that in each row, each column, uh, there are different colors. And then you have, you see there are different heights of those pieces. So in a sense, they are correspond to the ranks of officers. So look here at this picture, by the way, this uh, it's called uh, 36 cube the world's most challenging puzzle. So this looks like apparently a solution of the problem of Euler. Why? Because there is, you see, in each column, each row, there are different colors and there are different heights. So this almost proves that the Euler was wrong. But of course, only, because mathematically Euler was correct. And this is, as you can guess, maybe not cheating, but this is physical imperfection. So colors are well done, but here, the trick is that four of those pieces, they look to be of height four, but in fact, they are of height three or something like this. So with this help, this, this problem has a solution. But classically, I can assure you this original mathematical problem of Euler has no solution. By the way, how do you think why it has no solution? Well, mathematicians will know because six is two times three. So it's not a prime number. And four is not prime number either, but the power of two. And six is the first number, which is neither prime nor a power of prime. And therefore, in mathematics, there are many, many effects which are related to number six, which is special. For instance, there are not so-called um, finite planes consisting exactly of six different points. And no um, Greek or Latin squares of size six. So now look, we will go back from Latin squares and classical combinatorics to quantum. I will go back to the case of many systems and I will now define a single measure of entanglement and I will define a very simple notion of absolutely maximally entangled states. Amen. By the way, this problem was also studied by a Nobel laureate. You know the names of the Nobel laureates, perhaps? So I can show you here the paper Facchi. There was another paper by uh, authors were Severini, uh, no, uh, Pascaccio and um, Parisi. So Parisi got the Nobel Prize. And interestingly, he was also working on this problem. They called them maximally entangled state. So the idea was simple. We look for such states which are maximally entangled, bell-like for any choice of splitting. So let's assume we have four parties and we say, ah, if we split them into bipartite like this, they are generalized bell states, maximally entangled. But if we swap some subsystems, this property should be preserved. They are also maximally entangled. So basically there are three different, uh, for four subsystems, there are three different splitting of four elements into two pairs. So Ame, absolutely maximally entangled states, analyzed also by Parisi and others, are defined by the way that this entanglement is maximal. So if you take in general n objects, if you perform partial trace over half of it, you will have maximally, mm, you will have maximally mixed the state. This is a basic mm, notion in my talk. So now let me ask you, do you understand this idea? So examples are simple for Bell state. It is just, okay, it's called one uniform. So it is just called state, I'm a state of two qubits. So they exist. One uniform means that if you perform partial trace over one subsystem, the remaining state is maximally mixed. However, interestingly, Higuchi and Sudbury proved that there are no such states for four qubits. However, there exists such states for four q treats. There exists a, such state for six q quads. So now notation is following. Six four means six subsystems of four levels each. And now my question is, what about 
I'm a state for four subsystems with six levels each. Whether they exist. So I can tell you, nobody knew even a year ago whether they exist. And I will show you a relation to the problem of Euler. Namely, I claim that the state, absolutely maximally entangled state of four qubits exists. So here it is. Here it is. This is the state of four qubits. So we have four subsystems um, and three levels each. So I label them from zero, one, and two. And this is a very peculiar state. You can check, it's not so difficult to check, that it satisfies this property if you, out of four subsystems, choose any two, perform partial trace. So over average over two subsystems, put them away, the remaining state is maximally mixed. And now how to relate it to our combinatorial notion of Greco-Latin square. So here is a really Greco-Latin square of size three. So you see Greek letter, Latin letter, it corresponds to such a, a composition of nine cards. Now I need to use only three aces, kings, and queens. Or for information science, we can use just those numbers. We can label two letters going from zero to two. So you see now that this is exactly the same Greek or Latin square. And the recipe to write this special Amma state is very simple. First two digits is just address, like zero, zero. And second two digits, those red uh, numbers, are given by the uh, contents of this box. So first is zero, 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 zero. Now the second box has address zero, one. We go here, we look, ah, king of um, clubs is denoted by one, two. So we put one, two here. Third box, queen of diamonds is denoted by two and one. So we put here two and one. Now second row is represented by those numbers. And it gives us this line. Again, first two numbers are just addressed, second row. And second two digits here are taken from this line, while the third one corresponds to the third line here. So now a key question. Do you understand the relation between this object, Greek or Latin square, and this state? Now the key argument is the following. The fact that in each row, each column, there exists only one ace, or one king, one queen, or one color of each card implies that for this state, if you take partial trace over whatever two subsystems out of four, you get maximally mixed state, you get maximal entanglement. Therefore, this condition of Greek or Latin square is crucial. By the way, it's also possible to, um, out of such a state, why they are useful, you can immediately write down a quantum error correction code, which is written here. So this gives you a relation between our states and the classical problem, combinatorial problem of Greco-Latin squares. So now, why do we care about those AMA states? Because of different applications like quantum codes, teleportations, and things like this. And then there was a um, paper, even a table online by Huber and Videlka. So here are different uh, local dimension and different number of parties. So basically green means such states exist, that it doesn't exist. So here this question mark corresponds to local dimension six and local number of parties four. So four Q hex. So this was the open case a year ago. Um, so the key issue is whether such strange state exists. And now uh, we cannot, uh, since having Latin square, we could easily write it down. But we know because of Euler that such a solution, uh, such an object does not exist for n equals six. So standard Latin square will not exist. But maybe there is some new notion of quantum Latin square. So here I'm pleased to quote a paper done together with Dardo, Dardo Goscheneche. So you see here there is an Argentinian uh, liaison. Even we, it was done this paper as he was still in Poland. So we invited, we somehow managed to generalize this notion to mutually orthogonal quantum Latin squares. So Latin square, you know how it looks like. Quantum is instead of having numbers, we have states. So now we have a table of here, in this case, 16 states, 
such that in each row, each column, you have an orthogonal basis. So in a sense, they are different objects. Well, to have a pair of quantum Latin square, we need to find a D square states in the bipartite um, Hilbert space. So you have D square states, we can put them into such a square. So uh, in fact, it's convenient for me to take the state and as before, decompose it in a product basis. So each state corresponds to such a matrix, CKL. So now I have D squared those matrices. And now the orthogonality constraints are the following. This is a block matrix. And then the, it's block unitary in the sense that if you consider a sum over I over J, then this, so basically row wise sum each a vector of blocks is orthogonal to another block. So there are those two conditions. And then if those conditions are satisfied, they are just conditions similar to standard definition of classical orthogonality, then the following state, look, the following state is now four parity state, ij and phi ij defined here, which are defined by this huge matrix, they form an AMA state. So absolutely maximally entangled state of four subsystems with D levels each. Well, so uh, some uh, other remark is that this state, um, you can be represented like this. So this is here a entangled state, um, Bell state of four uh, Q hex. And now you look for such a, unitary matrix which entangles now subsystem, let's say A and B together. So this unitary matrix which does the job maximizes so-called entangling power. So now here's a picture of, from Krakow. Some of you were here uh, could enjoy it. I presume I have only a few minutes left. So I will now show you how to solve the problem. Which problem? To find the absolutely maximally entangled state of for Q hex. So here is this solution we know for three Q treats. So we know that from this pattern, we can formulate such a state. So there is a matrix U of size nine. It's a permutation matrix, which tells us where to put different cards. It's matrix of size nine. And it has the following property. If we perform partial transpose, it's also a permutation matrix. If we perform reshuffling, so reorder, reorder elements of those matrix. So if you use this tensor um, notation, we reorder, uh, or, uh, reorder a sequence of indices, then it is still permutation. So those reorderings correspond simply to different splitting of the entire systems into two subsystems. We have three such a splitting, like this, like this, and like this. Mm, so we uh, wish to maximize this entangling power. And then here we use the following variables. For any U, we define this entangling power, which can be defined by the E is just ent linear entropy of the vector of Schmidt coefficients of the operator Schmidt decomposition of U. S is the swap operator. So for any u, I can explicitly write down, compute such, an, uh, such a number. And then I can compute the uh, dual number you see here is plus and minus. So this is this, um, it's called um, typicality of a gate. And I wish to maximize this number. So look, here is a very nice uh, pattern, a square six times six. We use now 36 cards, and you see it's almost a solution of the problem of Euler. Why almost? Because I have two queen of diamonds and two jack of uh, two jacks of hearts, and this point is a permutation matrix which corresponds as some point here. So now I want to use this point as a starting point for my procedure to look for the uh, optimum. Optimum will be uh, will optimize the entangling power, so it will be at the right edge of this allowed space. 
Yes, I'm going to finish very, very soon. So we did some numerical search in the following way. Carol, so, Carol yes. you can go yes. on. You can go on, but you shall uh, will take off uh, time for questions. Yeah, yeah. But so it's I, fine. I, I, if, I perhaps yes, it's better yes, if you finish yeah. because so, yeah, it's better. Uh, the idea is following: we want look for such a matrix, which not only is unitary, but also after reshuffling and after partial transpose is unitary. And the idea is the following: we perform such an operation, and then we it's in general not unitary matrix. By the polar decomposition, we look for a, a closest unitary and we continue. And then it, very often this procedure is not convergent, does not give anything interesting. However, if you are lucky, if you find a good starting point, so look, look here, this is another approximation to the solution of problem of Euler. Why is not a good solution? Because you have two jacks in the same column. And then starting from some of those permutation matrices, this here you see a trajectory in this space. Strangely enough, it converges just to this corner. So corner is two unitary matrix we are looking for. So it's a matrix of size 36, which enjoys very special properties. Not only is it a unitary matrix, but also the shuffled U or partial transpose are still unitary, which means that it defines such a absolutely maximally entangled state. So then this numerical, this, we get some numerical values of this matrix 36, some 36 were uh, difficult to understand, but fortunately we had the freedom of taking local operations of size six and we find a simpler form. And then after a simpler form, we can, after nice permutation, we can bring it to the block form, the, like nine blocks of size four. And now since it should be unitary matrix in each block, we could write unitarity conditions and then we could solve them analytically. And we could prove that only also after partial transpose and um, after the shuffling, it's still unitary. So here comes the result, results analytical. We can call it a golden state, why? Because the golden ratio, you know the number, one plus square root of five over two appears in the solution. So basically here you see there are those nine blocks of size four, and all of them are functions of three numbers, A, B, and C, which are known analytically and the phase omega and omega is just the um, uh, root of identity of order 20. So you have here different powers. So basically now this solution is found analytically. It is related geometrically to this pentagon. So it allows us to write the solution of the Euler problem in the following sense. So we know such a square six times six does not exist if there's only a single card here. But now look, we allow those two cards to be entangled. We are joking that the officers are entangled like general with a, Lloyd, with a colonel. So if we allow king of spades to be entangled with ace of clubs and have such a structure, it corresponds just to the quantum version of orthogonal quantum, a pair of quantum orthogonal Latin squares. And now, this golden Amma state corresponding to 36 officers of Euler has very, very peculiar property, the following. If you choose any two dices and measure a state of two dices, so you look, each of them lives in the subsystem of size six because a dice has six faces. So it conveys a number of one to six. Then after this measurement, you can know what will be the outcome of the measurement of the remaining two dices. It's like in the Bell system, Bell state. So I think I should fi finish now. So main message is that we could study strongly entangled extremal multi-parted quantum states, extremal because they maximize, for instance, this entangling power and many different uh, properties. And we found such new states, which are useful for many different purposes like error correction codes or quantum communication. So in short, we have a theorem that absolutely maximally entangled states of four subsystems with six levels each do exist. And strangely enough, we achieved this result uh, this year, 2021. So exactly 121 years after Tari's paper was written 121 years, so 11 square after the problem of Euler was posed.
And then this our solution implies that there is a solution of a quantum analog of the famous problem of 36 officers of Euler. There exists an optimal bipartite unitary gate of size 36, which maximizes entangling power. There exists a perfect tensor with four indices, each running from one to six, such that if you exchange indices, mm, the unitarity does not change. And such tensors are now used in tensor networks or in study of bulk boundary correspondence. And this state allows us to write down the quantum error correction code, which allows us to encode one Q hex, so physical system with like a dice, uh, quantum dice into a free such subsystems. So I hope that I convince you that such extremal quantum states can be useful. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Carol. Thanks. Thanks for this wonderful, wonderful talk. So now we have some time for questions. Please, if someone has a question, write it down in the chat and I, I will pick it up. So if if nothing, no one has a question, I have I have a question, Carol, because yes. um, uh, from from some time ago, it, it's lurking in my mind the idea of applying maximal maximum entropy principle to study entanglement. Because it seems that for very relevant uh, entangled state like the AIME, so for some subsystems, you have a maximization of, of entropy for the subsystem because you said maximal mixture, you can read it as a maximization of entropy. Sure. Uh, sure. What do you think about that idea? Do you know of any work of someone no, no, doing look, that? Of course, it's a very good question, but this is exactly what we are doing because we want to maximize entanglement. So in a sense, the entropy of entanglement, but look, with respect to this partition, but also with respect to this partition, and also with respect to this partition. So in a sense, we want to optimize the sum of three different entropies, which characterize a single state, because those three entropies, you have four, four subsystems, and they are uh, correspond to splitting of the entire system into different subsystems, yes? So our research was just to optimize to maximize the sum of three entropies, which correspond and <coughs> respect to different splittings. Okay, okay, I see. Thanks. Yes, I, I will have to. Uh, fortunately, the the talk uh, will uh, is is recorded and we will publish it on the website. And I will see it again, <laughs> of course, many times to try to understand all the details. Yes. Thank so, you very much. So thanks, so also, thanks, Carol. Uh, thanks, Carol. Uh, I'm also pleased to recommend you this paper, which is now uh, available uh, uh, on the archive. And I uh, emphasize that the um, Adam Burkhardt had a um, so uh, Suail Rata found the state, and Adam found its analytical form. Okay, okay. We will we will check it carefully. Well, we thank again. Now there's no more time. Uh, we thank again Professor Sikowski for this great talk and staying here with us again yes. we we are really thankful for you so we give some internet clubs thank Professor you very much <laughs> thanks thank you. thanks